Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and being online watching us today. I really want to take this opportunity to thank the people of Mississippi. I want to thank you for your dedication to this fight, and I want you to know that you are winning. You are flattening the curve. Three weeks ago, the top national models predicted that we would have 8,984 Mississippians in hospital beds with COVID-19 today. They predicted we would have 1,356 in ICU beds. They, would, they predicted we would have more than 1,085 Mississippians on ventilators because of the virus. They predicted we would see 90 deaths today. In fact, we have 401 Mississippians in hospital beds, not nearly 9,000. We have 148 in ICU beds, not 1,300. We have 74 on ventilators, not 1,000. We did see eight tragic deaths yesterday, but that's far short of 90. That's because of you, the people of this state. Behind every number, there is a name. Every Mississippi death is a tragedy. Every Mississippian that is struggling to deal with this painful, cruel disease needs our utmost commitment and steadfast prayer. I do not share these statistics to minimize individual suffering. I just want the people of Mississippi to know your work is making a difference. We are containing the virus in our state. Even as we've dramatically ramped up testing, the number of new cases we found has grown much slower than we expected. We haven't seen the rapid spike predicted by many. We haven't seen the rapid spike that has occurred in many other states. Our testing is so robust, our numbers are so low, and our growth is so slow that our health experts say it may take many weeks or months to see the number of new cases drop for two straight weeks. That's a good thing. It means we didn't have the sharp peak that many states experienced. Dr. Dobbs and his team in our health department tell me, tells me it, can, it means we can safely start to shift our strict rules on all Mississippians. We can continue to be smart, we can avoid using a sledgehammer, and we can be more surgical in our decisions. Social distancing is working. Our aggressive testing and contact tracing are working. You are saving lives, but we cannot let our guard down. We cannot pretend this is over. It is not. The fight must go on. Why? Because we are facing a public health crisis. This threat is real. It is deadly. This virus is historically contagious. We must not take it lightly. But we are also facing a historic economic crisis. In a typical week before this virus hit our soil, about 1,000 Mississippians would apply for unemployment assistance. In the past few weeks alone, we have seen about 150,000 Mississippians apply with many more attempting to get through but blocked by the surge. This disease has not hit every American fairly. It is particularly cruel to some. And the economic damage has not hit American, every American fairly either. It has been particularly cruel to the working class, those people who work on their feet, those people who don't have a home office or paid leave, those people who come home with calluses on their hands because they did a hard day's work for an honest day's pay. Wall Street and Hollywood will be okay. In fact, they'll be just fine. Mississippi small businesses and workers have bared the brunt of this damage. That's who has been asked to shoulder the country's burden. It's not fair, 
and it's not right. We are starting to reopen our economy. We cannot slam the door open. That would be reckless and put lives at risk. It's not a light switch that only goes on and off. It's a dimmer. We can take measured steps to make life better for Mississippians. We must recognize that there is no such thing as a non-essential Mississippian. Every job is essential to the worker and his or her family who depend on its paycheck for food, for supplies, and for shelter. This morning, I signed a new executive order, a safer at home order. It goes into effect on Monday at 8 a.m. Here's what it does. It urges all Mississippians to stay home except for essential travel. That's still the safest behavior. I continue to ask you, please stay at home as much as you possibly can. You still have to be smart. You are still responsible for your safety and for the safety of your loved ones. Make the best decisions for you and your family. It tells all who the federal task force guidelines have defined as most vulnerable to shelter in place. That means the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, people whose immune systems are compromised. The list is in our executive order. If you're not in these categories, you should still stay at home if at all possible. This just represents the most vulnerable group and therefore the strictest rules. The order bans all social or non-essential gatherings of 10 or more. That is still illegal in Mississippi and it will be enforced. It also changes the part of our strategy that has given me the most heartache. For almost every Mississippian, it will no longer be impossible to work. We are allowing most closed businesses to reopen under certain health and safety mandates developed with our health department. I wish we could open up for everybody, but we're still not at that point yet. I won't take any action that our health experts tell me creates unreasonable risk. So there are still some categories of businesses that will have to stay closed. Places of amusement or entertainment, things like movie theaters, bars, and museums. Businesses that cannot avoid sustained person-to-person -person contact, salons, gyms, clubs, spas, tattoo parlors, and barber shops will remain closed to the public. You can still sell excess supplies by phone or the internet. I know that's not enough, but maybe it can help keep the lights on. I want you to open. We're just not there yet, and there's one step of gradual reopening. Your day will come as soon as it is safe, I promise. Restaurants will continue to be limited to drive-through, carry-out, or delivery. Bars are still closed. Schools are still closed. Casinos are still closed. Newly opened retail stores have to reduce capacity by at least 50% to avoid crowds. Businesses have to follow CDC and health department guidelines, like sending sick employees home, wearing masks, screening for symptoms, and social distancing as much as possible. Common areas where people gather will need to stay closed. Evictions are still prohibited because we are still telling Mississippians to stay at home. Healthcare professionals can begin to do more procedures under rules set by the health department. We are confident that our healthcare system will not be overloaded. Our order is statewide. We looked closely at doing this on a regional basis. We looked at every county's data in detail. Ultimately, Dr. Dobbs and I concluded that this was a measured step and there is no county or city in the state where this would be unsafe. This safer at home order is not a return to normal. I wish it was. 
I know one day we will. Today is not that day. We believe that it is safe and appropriate to take these steps. Dr. Dobbs and our health department have been critical in developing these rules. They are based on data, investigation, and science. Dr. Dobbs and I also had the privilege of speaking personally with Dr. Burks this morning. We gave her a preview of what we were considering. She shared that she has studied our very low, slow growth and that we are approaching this the right way. It still relies on our trust in you, just as it, just as it did before. Not everything that is legal is wise. There is no government replacement for wisdom. Freedom always carries risk. We still believe in personal responsibility. You should do what you think is best for your family. There is no state order that can replace your common sense. That is the best tool we have in Mississippi to continue to curtail the growth of this virus. We're working hard to keep you and your family safe and secure. Stay home, stay safe, stay smart. With that, I'll ask Dr. Dobbs to offer his perspective on our next step and an update on the state of COVID-19 in the great state of Mississippi. Dr. Dobbs. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, just, just to kick it off, certainly we have been looking at the data extremely closely, um, obviously on a perpetual basis. And based on our understanding of new cases coming in, hospital utilization, which has been steady or declining in several measures, also looking at our influenza like illness data or surveillance data on people who come to the emergency room with illnesses that are consistent with COVID-19. We've seen pretty steady and um, significant declines over the past several weeks. That doesn't mean that we have absolute confidence that we've passed our peak, but it, these are very strong indicators that we're on the right path. Um, the data and certainly the science and the guidelines support this very cautious measured but appropriate step toward bringing us back a little bit closer to normalcy. Um, I, I would like to give the governor um, a credit for the dimming analogy. I think that the White House was very pleased by that. So if they start using that on national TV, it did start here. <laughs> we, we can have a claim to fame. So um, we, we, we feel confident that this is a measured appropriate step at this time um, after much careful deliberation. Also, other things that you can expect to change as part of the executive order and also, too, with Department of Health guidelines is a lot of people are in need of medical attention that they've put off for a month or so. Uh, so we're working very close um, with our docs, our hospitals, our clinics, our ambulatory surgery centers, and we're going to have um, not only as part of the executive order to help them, again, in a measured, cautious, thoughtful way, start getting back to work so that they can take care of people with more urgent medical needs, um, but also have a pathway for more, uh, you know, getting back to normal medical care sort of scenario. And the same sort of process is happening with the Board of Dental, dental Examiners so that we can uh, get back to much needed uh, dental care. Because this is going to be a new temporary normal. This isn't going to be resolved within a month. We're still going to be dealing with this. We've got to find a way to coexist with this in a way that it's safe. But to reiterate, even though we're making these sort of slow and measured steps toward uh, reopening Mississippi, still the most important things that people can do are in their own hands. It's going to be maintaining social distancing, not attending social gatherings, making sure it's important to be around the same people you're going to be around, right? So if you're around 10 people, but they're different people all throughout the day, that doesn't really count, right? You're going to be exposed to different folks. Wearing a mask in public, those sorts of basic things that we know are very important um, are going to be the most important thing, far more important even than some of these, you know, restrictions that we've had to go through over the past, over the past weeks. Um, just as a quick sort of update, I'll just go over the numbers uh, rapidly. We have, we're reporting 281 new, de new cases today and, and sadly eight additional deaths, bringing our total uh, case number up to 5,434 with 209 total deaths. Um, the uh, racial disparities persisting um, as expected with 53% of cases among African Americans and 61% of deaths. If we look at our hospital utilization, we continue to see stability and availability of 
hospital beds, ICU, et cetera, um, giving us additional confidence that we can start allowing additional medical procedures to occur for people who have certainly much uh, built up need. So currently have 74 COVID patients on mechanical ventilation, 148 in the ICU with uh, 684 open and available ventilators and 253 open and available ICU beds. Um, we continue um, with our uh, increased testing um, although we've seen uh, some diminished demand in the public health lab with a total volume of 55,389 at last count. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Michelle to give us an update uh, on the many emergency declarations that exist in Mississippi right now. Thank you, Governor. Yes, sir, uh, we are uh, definitely busy. 19 tornadoes um, the last three storms you had, uh, or we, Mississippi had um, starting in, uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, just to give you an update, um, on the Easter storms, 12 April still, uh, as you know, we got the emergency declaration uh, there with that. Um, we have the um, disaster assistance centers that are opening up in three of those counties. We'll open up tomorrow, as we reported yesterday. We have those locations. Uh, one uh, will be opening up in Covington County, and that will be at the Seminary United Methodist Church. Uh, the one in Jefferson Davis County will be opening up at the L.L. Roberts United Methodist Church. And then in Jones County, we'll be opening up a survivor assistance center there for Antioch at Antioch United Methodist Church. Uh, the hours will be in operation starting Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then they will be open on Saturday from 8 to noon. And they will be closed on Sunday. And if we need to extend that past that one week period, we will. Keep in mind, these disaster assistance centers are there uh, to support those individuals that don't have access to phone or internet. In a lot of cases, individuals have lost everything and don't have the access to do that. Uh, given the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, the engagement with the Red Cross and FEMA is different than we normally would have. So the face-to-face the -face interaction there is not there. So these centers have been put into place to assist with that and to help individuals fill out their claims. For those that do have access to internet, um, you can go and sign up. You can call 1-800-RED-CROSS uh, if you need uh, a place to stay and uh, don't have lodging. Uh, with regards to your reporting the damage that you have to your homes, you can go to msema.org. That's MEMA's website. I'll say again, msema.org. Uh, pull down the contact drop down and go to self-report, and each county has a link where you can go in and upload photos and any damage that you have. If you go to the in-person uh, uh, survivor uh, assistance centers, uh, make sure you bring your social security number, make sure you bring any type of insurance information that you do have on the uh, property, uh, pictures or specific information about the damage that you've uh, been rendered at your home, financial type information uh, for your family, for household income before taxes, and then of course contact any financial information you have from there. Uh, on the April 19th storms that we had, uh, damage assessments are continuing there in those counties reported damage and then the storms that happened uh, on April the 22nd and the 23rd there were three tornadoes we got the weather service assessments on that today Rankin County had an EF0 Amit Pike County had a, a, a small track tornado that was rated at an EF2 and then Jones County had an EF2 there as well um, and one injury in George County so still continue to be very busy and uh, Governor I'll turn it back to you sir Thank you, Director. I uh, appreciate all of your efforts and your team's efforts along with Dr. Dobbs and his team uh, during these challenging times. With that, uh, I will open the floor to questions and we'll start uh, with Courtney Ann. I know that last week with the extension, you talked about allowing curbside and delivery with those non-essential businesses. Now with retail uh, businesses being able to have some foot traffic, even if it's at 50%, how hopeful are you guys that that will even further reduce that overcrowding that you talked about being concerned with at the big box stores? Well, I think that's certainly a, a potential uh, positive side effect. Uh, not only are we uh, allowing our small business owners and, and stores to reopen, um, to do so in a responsible way where there are limited numbers of people, uh, that is going to naturally drive uh, people away from the big box stores, uh, and we hope that is uh, uh, an advantage um, as a side effect to, to doing this. Um, it's not the reason we did it, uh, but we do think that uh, as we talk about risk levels, and, and let's, let's keep in mind everything that we say and everything, every decision we make is about risk levels uh, relative to other decisions that could be made. And so uh, we feel like that certainly 
um, is a, a risk uh, level uh, that reduces the overall risk potentially if fewer people are in box stores. Governor, Ross. Are you saying that the stores that, that were, that you talked about, the clothing stores, athletic stores, are you talking about all retail stores like Belt at the mall, the shopping centers? Retail stores will be allowed to open under these guidelines, um, but they will have to take necessary measures to ensure that they have no more than half of full capacity. So every store, for instance, has uh, state fire marshal has said your full capacity at this store is 100 people. Well, they will have to take measures uh, to ensure that they have 50 or less in the store at one e any one time, which helps ensure that social distancing can take place. Again, we are not saying to individuals, don't take your whole family, don't take seven people uh, to go to uh, a retail store um, because that's not a smart way in which to do it. But we are allowing that store to open and to open at uh, half capacity. But it sounds like you're sending a mixed message. You want you have this new safer at home order, yet you're telling people to go out and shop. No, I don't think we're sending a, a mixed message, Ross. What I think we're doing is we're we're telling the people in Mississippi that we trust them to make good personal decisions. Uh, they need to understand the risk that exists uh, and understand that we are not uh, telling them to do so. We're simply saying to businesses, we're not as a government going to keep you shut down for any longer. Um, you know, when we originally entered the shelter in place order back three weeks ago, or, or will be on Monday, uh, we said it had to be for a short period of time. Uh, we don't believe that individuals can shelter in place. We don't believe that individuals can uh, necessarily be forced by government to stay in their homes for months and months and months on end. It had to be for a short period of time to make sure that we significantly lessen the height of the curve. Uh, we feel as if we have done that. It has helped work, um, helped us get to the point where we are able to safely reopen uh, retail stores. We're not uh, here encouraging people to run out and go to retail stores. We're just simply saying to those small business owners and, and larger business owners uh, that we as a government are not going to lock you out. I guess based on what I'm hearing, the focus is on just opening retail stores. I mean, you list, uh, there are a lot of people who work as uh, in nail salons, hair salons, barber shops that aren't making any money. Uh, why isn't there a recommendation for them to be able to practice and open their business, at least wearing a mask or something to protect themselves? It, it's a great question. It's one that we have struggled with mightily and struggled with um, over the last several days. Um, and, and I think, and I'll answer it from my perspective and I'll let Dr. Dobbs answer it from his. Uh, I think the major issue there is the close interpersonal contact uh, between those in nail salons and barber shops, et cetera, um, and their customers. Uh, it's, on, it's you, you, by definition, uh, you cannot do someone's nails or cut someone's hair without touching them. Uh, without being close enough to them where the spread of the virus would be uh, very high risk. In addition to that, uh, not, only do, not only are they in a position in which that is the case, uh, you also, in these uh, facilities, and remember some of the, the guidelines that I've talked about over the last several weeks, uh, the, the worst thing we can, and, and when we talked about shutting down schools, it's taking people from lots of different areas, bringing them all into one spot. In this case, if you had one salon um, person or one nail person or one barber who had the virus and 30 or 40 people came in one day and then the next day and then the next day and and that particular individual was to infect them and then send them all back out um, given the high risk of uh, the, the virus spreading because of that close interpersonal contact um, you could get into a situation in which you had significant community spread very very quickly. Yeah, exactly. It's always a, it's a matter of risk mitigation. Um, as we sort of step back into doing more and more, um, the things that we have a strong confidence that you are capable of maintaining social distance are the easiest ones to start with. You know, we still have significant COVID transmission in the community, although we've seen stability and certainly flattened the curve and some of the markers are, are looking, you know, uh, pretty reassuring. Uh, we don't want to turn that back up, right? So um, until we have additional assurance, and we can look at, um, you know, the risks, sort of the risk profile is better. 
things where people are going to have to be in close proximity for you know a good duration of time are just we're just not quite there yet. And, and let me just say this as well: for virtually each one of these categories of of individuals, um, our our my commission on economic recovery have taken a look at them. Uh, there have been scenarios in which um, there have been recommendations on ways in which these individual entities could reopen in a safe way. Uh, we are looking at those. Uh, we are monitoring those. We, um, while this particular order, and I'm not sure if I said this earlier or not, this particular order is in effect for two weeks. That does not mean that we're not going to amend it um, uh, over the next two weeks. If, as we become more and more confident that we can reopen more businesses, we will do so um, in a responsible way. Uh, we are looking at the guidelines. For instance, um, we had a, a, an individual group of casinos uh, that sent to me and sent to the Gaming Commission a list of ways that they thought they could reopen in a responsible way. Um, the Gaming Commission, I understand, is putting together uh, a list of scenarios under which they think that uh, the businesses that they regulate can reopen in a responsible way. Eventually, those will get to us and we'll take a look at them and we'll probably make some changes here and there. Um, but the decision that is made for this next step in this dimming process um, is one that we think we are at a point where we're ready. As we move into next week, we're going to continue to look at every single of the ones of the current businesses that are still closed, the prohibitive activities, and see if there are ways in which we can do so. We're just not quite there yet. Renee? David Elliott from WLOX has a question. Great. Dave? Governor, the governor, how are you today? A little more on what you just addressed. I think everybody recognized that reopening the casinos was probably going to be the trickiest thing of all. You, as you said, the Gaming Hospitality Association has sent a letter to the Gaming Commission with ideas on how to safely begin opening. In terms of the chain of command, does that decision rest with you, the Gaming Commission, or is it a coordinated effort? And do you have any idea as to a time frame well, Dave, thanks for that question. And the short answer is yes. Uh, the, the hierarchy, if you will, um, I think it's fair to say, much like all of these decisions that have been made uh, over the last six weeks have been uh, uh, joint decisions between the, the health department and myself. Um, the, the, the fact is, at the end of the day, if you're mad at anybody, get mad at me. I'm the one that has to ultimately make the decision. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, but I think um, with respect to the casinos, uh, as you know, um, in none of my orders do we address the gaming industry. And the reason we don't is because the Gaming Commission specifically took action with respect to those entities that they regulate. They did so in conjunction with us. And so what I, the way I would answer that question is um, the, the casinos, uh, it would be very surprising to me if the Gaming Commission decided to reopen the casinos uh, until we were all on the same page and in agreement. We have worked very closely uh, together with the, the um, Gaming Commission, and as we uh, continue to review uh, the guidelines in the letter that you mentioned uh, for gaming, um, the, you know, the, 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 one of the things with the gaming industry that, that concerns us is that there are large numbers of people, but by the same token, one of the advantages is when you look at the, the actual facility itself, it's also very, very large facility. So it could lend itself for people to social distance and things such as that. Uh, we don't have a final decision on that yet, but we're working on it. And my short answer to your question is, my guess is the Gaming Commission, uh, Dr. Dobbs and I will all be on the same page uh, before casinos actually open. Um, Aaron Kelly with the Green Star has a question. Great. Aaron? Good afternoon, Governor. Hi, Aaron. Um, I, have a question. I have a question more about the mitigation efforts uh, for Dr. Dobbs. As you know, unfortunately, here in Lauderdale County, we have the highest number of deaths and long-term care cases, and now the second highest case total. Um, I wanted to know what specifically the state is doing here to help with that, and then will there be priority testing? <coughs> homes, do you expect to um, name the nursing homes with more detailed information about the number of cases per month? Um, I, I think I got all that. Um, certainly Lauderdale County um, is, is, a, is an area that we've paid close attention to and will continue to. Um, we communicate regularly with uh, the medical leadership um, and also with the um, long-term care settings. Uh, as far as um, the 
the the long term care center, center like nursing home go. We have we're not planning on posting the names. Um, there's a lot of downside to that um, uh, that we've we've witnessed elsewhere and in previous situations. So um, we will not plan to do that. We will continue to provide as much detailed information as we as we possibly can so that folks can keep track of it. Um, as we go forward, especially with the long term care settings, and we've talked to the different professional societies and the physicians. Um, going forth now that we're moving into a different control phase, um, we plan to do 100% testing of everybody in a nursing home, including employees and residents, if they have even a single case. And that's going to be the Department of Health doing that so that we can immediately identify anybody who is uh, actively contagious and we can take more aggressive measures. Um, and we're going to be more aggressive in uh, these outbreak scenarios and others. So that's one piece to that. Um, as far as uh, other activities, we did um, send a um, one of our uh, rapid test machines to, to Meridian for your community to use. We're still waiting additional test supplies, so we want to make sure that that's available. Working closely with the, um, the docs in your community, especially the um, Femi Practice Residency Program, who've been fantastic partners, Rush and Anderson both. So we will continue to be committed to supporting the effort um, in Lauderdale County. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Dobbs. I, I want to point something out as well. Um, What's happening in Lauderdale County is is very frustrating for all of us, um, and, and I want to reiterate that behind every number there is a name, um, and that every single Mississippi death is a tragedy. But as we are looking at decisions that we are making, we have to trust the data. And as I look at what's happening in Lauderdale County uh, over the last f five to six to seven days, I remember much of what's happening in any one day really happened 14 days ago or 20 days ago when the actual virus started started um, um, moving around more rapidly. And so when you look at Lauderdale County, you'll recall that it was, uh, I think it was three weeks ago now, that our initial step into sheltering in place was one county, and that was Lauderdale County. And so um, what that tells me is I look at the data, it actually gives me more confidence in Dr. Dobbs and his team that they are analyzing the data and they're analyzing it correctly because exactly what the, the first county they came to me with um, was, was Lauderdale County and the concerns that they had there. And, and so much of what they were concerned about happening over a 10 to 15 day period is what we've seen over the last five to seven days. Um, um, Bobby Harrison from Mississippi Today has a question. Good. Bobby. Hey, Governor, real quick, uh, how does this order uh, coordinate with uh, local uh, municipal orders and how would they be affected? Yeah, Bobby, thanks for that. Um, thanks for that question. It doesn't coordinate with any local orders. Uh, what it does do is what the last several orders have done. It allows any municipality to be more strict than the state order but it doesn't allow them to be in direct conflict with um, any, um, any provision in this particular order. So, for instance, on um, restaurants, we allow curbside uh, pickup, and if a municipality, for whatever reason, decided that they wanted to completely close all restaurants, they certainly would have the ability to do so because they're not specifically listed as essential um, businesses. And so uh, cities can go further. Uh, but I will just remind everyone, uh, and, and particularly our um, mayors, who, by the way, I just got off a call um, with uh, Mayor Lumumba here in, in Jackson, and all, I think we had over 100 mayors on the line, and um, in outlining what we are doing. Um, the vast majority of mayors across Mississippi are doing fantastic work. Uh, some of them may see specific things in their communities and need to make some slight adjustments to what we do. And if that's what they need to do, that is their prerogative. Um, but uh, as I reminded uh, the mayors on the call, uh, the CARES Act does provide funding uh, for the state, but it is, it is explicit in the legislation that that funding cannot be used for lost revenues at the state level or at the local level. And so uh, the longer businesses are closed, um, particularly retail businesses in terms of um, sales, uh, that does have consequences uh, to each municipality. So, Ross? We heard Dr. Dobbs talking about the disproportionate impact that the coronavirus deaths has on African Americans. And you're talking about reopening retail stores. A lot of African Americans work in the retail sector. 
are you forcing, could, could this force people back into an environment where they could be putting their lives at risk of getting this deadly virus? Yeah, so um, it, it's really important to, to keep in mind how important, I mean, th what we're talking about was going on a month ago is very different than where we are now. And if we're looking retroactively, that's really where the troubles um, began for certain as far as transmission. If we are diligent in wearing our masks in public, employees wearing masks in public, maintaining social distancing, making sure we're using proper hand hygiene, all the things that we know will work, it can be done safely. It's a matter of doing it uh, that way. We've, we've, we have to find a way to find a new normal because this isn't going anywhere. It's not, if, we can't wait this out, right? It's not going anywhere. So when the information supports an opportunity for us to make a small step forward, it, we need to, and so that's what we're doing. So these employees that are going back, if they're going back to work when these retail stores open, will they be required to wear masks inside the stores, employees? Uh, they're not mandated in, in, the, um, in the order that they wear masks. It is highly recommended. Uh, we do, um, it is highly recommended by me personally. Uh, we also uh, do mandate in the order that the uh, various businesses take precautionary measures, ensuring hand sanitizer is available and things such as that. And so what, what I will tell you, and, and we've watched what has transpired um, over the uh, last three or four weeks, um, and I've been in contact with uh, small and large businesses all across the state, and what we have found is that um, the vast majority of businesses are, are taking extra steps and extra precautions. Uh, we anticipate that when retail stores open, the small business owners are going to continue to take. Uh, without question, they're going to continue to, uh, to take necessary precautions. It is my view, uh, and I, I talk to governors every single day, and I think it's, this is becoming a consensus view. Uh, there is not nearly as much spread that has occurred in the United States of America by people who are being at work when compared to the types of spread that has occurred at social gatherings, weddings, funerals, folks hanging out at the local park in groups of 150 or 200. That's really where the community spread and community outbreak has occurred in America. And again, this is more anecdotal than it is data driven, but I really firmly believe that is the case. But if you are in a vulnerable position, uh, we encourage you, if you have a job and you're, you're one of the vulnerable uh, folks, uh, please talk to your employer. Uh, I think most employers will want to work with them to, to put them in a position to either stay at home, uh, if that is uh, an option, uh, or to take extra necessary uh, precautions uh, to wear a mask, et cetera. Now keep in mind, every mask is not the same. Uh, I don't think people in a retail setting necessarily have to have an N95 mask. I think a cloth mask would be acceptable in that scenario, which obviously have um, different scenarios with respect to price and availability, quite frankly. Um, so, Courtney. Um, Dr. Dobbs, we saw the department had tweeted about the need for certified nursing assistants. I know that we talked a little bit more about staffing, medical staffing early on. Is there a particular need for that right now, or is that kind of part of the norm? In and I, I didn't see that it was certified nursing assistants, CNAs? Yeah, it's a, it's a MSDH needs certified nursing assistants for the battle against COVID-19. Oh, okay. Um, um, yeah, so there, there will certainly be certain um, employment gaps in the health system. Uh, as far as uh, the uh, investigation goes, as far as, I think most people think about the, um, the contact tracing, when, and, and that's been in the media a lot. And so um, it takes a, a, a high skill set and a lot of training, and certainly we're committed to doing that as we add new people. Primarily, we're hiring nurses and epidemiologists who have some existing medical background or some public health training. Um, but there are going to be other gaps. Um, uh, CNAs are extremely important in long-term care settings. Also, we have these alternate care sites that we're working on to make sure that we can take care of folks if they need prolonged recovery. And so it's going to be for all these different sort of uh, gaps in the system that we're trying to fill out for these um, extra locations or if there are sick individuals we have to fill in for, we will be looking for folks to, to take care of that. And certainly appreciate everyone willing to step in the breach and make sure we can take care of our state. And I haven't seen that. My, my guess is that's more for the department than it is for the industry because what we're seeing from an industry standpoint, healthcare space, 
Uh, we're actually seeing layoffs and because uh, utilization of hospitals is way down. People are, were scared to go there. We're gonna, that's going to change a little bit with this new order. Um, but I've encouraged Dr. Dobbs and his team to continue to build capacity because we don't know if this virus is coming back in the fall, but um, it seems likely to me, um, have, not having a science background, that it is likely to come back in the fall. And we now have resources from the federal government that will help us ensure that we build our teams so that we can be ready if and when it comes. Same way with PPE and other things. We want to restock our state stockpile as the supply chains continue to improve so that we are ready, so that we're not scrambling to the extent that we were four or five, six weeks ago. I'm very proud of our team for having the ability to go out and ensure that every single Mississippian that could get better with quality care got that quality care. Um, that we had adequate PPE, although it was very tight, uh, day after day after day. Um, we don't want to be in that position again. Um, you know, we, we didn't in envision it being like this, us having a pandemic um, in the first 45 days of, of my tenure, but uh, it, it is what it is, and we're just going to try to do everything we can to build from it. And so um, another area I would just like to mention with respect to building capacity and building resources, we've talked a lot about um, how good – uh, the state of Mississippi has done from a testing perspective. There was $25 billion in the most recent bill that was signed by the president earlier this morning. Uh, for testing of that, $11 billion of it is, is designated for the states. And so I look forward uh, to figuring out exactly um, how that money is going to be distributed and what we can do with it and how we can utilize it to continue to build our testing capacity um, because we think that's important. Renee? Uh, Sarah from North Hey, Governor, um, how is this going to impact religious organizations and gatherings and churches? Are they going to still be considered under the non-gathering of 10 or more? Or are there going to be any, uh, is there any consideration for that at this time? Well, thanks for that question, Sarah. Th there are no changes in the order uh, to the way in which we have been uh, dealing with churches. Uh, I have said repeatedly I don't believe the government can shut down churches, uh, but I do believe that I as governor can ask uh, our pastors to be responsible, and we have encouraged uh, our pastors to not have in-service, in-house services uh, in which you bring large groups of people into one gathering. We saw community outbreaks that occurred from that four, five, six weeks ago. And so at this point, uh, we are continuing to ask our pastors to preach online if at all possible. Uh, again, the, the, the order doesn't mandate it. Government's not telling any pastor that you can't do it, um, at least from the state level, because I think, don't think we have the constitutional ability to do that. But I can ask you to continue to stay vigilant. Please do not do gatherings of more than 10 people, um, because if you do, uh, you may be putting people at risk um, no, not knowingly, not not because you want to, but you may be putting people at risk. Uh, Stephen from New Mississippi has a question. Stephen? Hey, Governor, can you hear me? I can. Excellent. Um, I was curious, does this order have an expiration date? And if so, how often will that be revisited? This order does have an expiration date. It is in effect in full force until 8 a.m. on Monday, May 11th. So this is a two-week order. That does not mean that it cannot be amended or updated uh, or rescinded if that were to be the case. I don't think the latter option is very likely. Uh, I do think that the former is fairly likely, to, an amendment to, um, to look at some of these other areas as things become safe and as we delineate where the numbers are going and what the data indicates. Uh, and indicate whether or not we can perhaps make some, some more uh, slight um, adjustments to uh, further lessen the dim, if you will, on that dimmer. Uh, Dave Elliott from WLOX has another question. Great. Dave? Governor, I'm curious, these freedom protests have been breaking out all around the country. Uh, thousands of people concerned about locked down economies and what they consider an assault on civil liberties. According to social media, one is scheduled 
Tomorrow at noon in Capital City, uh, A, have you heard about that? B, do you sympathize with these groups or do you find their efforts counterproductive? Well, um, uh, someone mentioned it to me literally as I was walking in this door. Uh, and what I tell you is I think one of the fundamental foundational principles of living in America is for individuals have the right to protest their government and have the right to protest their leaders. Um, Mississippi is still in America, and America is still not China when it comes to these protests, period. And so while um, I would rather them uh, not be protesting what's going on in Mississippi, I fully support uh, and appreciate their right to do so. Um, look, people are upset and people are frustrated because of the challenges uh, that so many Mississippians are under that they've never been under before. You know, we've got 150,000 people that are on unemployment assistance now, and a large majority of them have never been on, on any government benefits in their life. And so, um, you know, this is, a, this is new to people, and people are frustrated, and I get it. And so um, I, I fully understand and appreciate their, their frustration and their concern, and I fully support the, their right uh, to gather and protest. Now, uh, I hope and I pray that they protest in a smart way. You know, drive by, um, drive by protests while honking the horn is certainly the best way to do it and what I encourage. Um, and my guess is many of these individuals are, are great Americans, um, some of whom probably voted for me last year, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, but I support their uh, ability to protest. I just hope they do it in a safe, responsible way. A quick follow up on the uh, medical and dental procedure. So these are uh, emergency procedures have been taking place. So this is are kind of re bringing in the um, elective procedures. Is that the way I understand it? That's correct. It, it would be um, definitely be uh, elective procedures, and I'll just give you an idea uh, of what we're talking about here. Um, the medical procedures should fall within tier two or tier three of the non-emergent elective medical services and treatment recommendations issued by CMS on April the 7th, 2020. We provide, we will actually provide the website on the, um, in the actual order uh, once you get a copy of that. And then we go in and we list four or five other things that, that need to be done. Um, for instance, um, the healthcare facilities, if a hospital, for instance, wants to do a non-emergent uh, uh, process um, surgeries, uh, then we just require them, for instance, to have 25% of hospital capacity available for the treatment of COVID-19 patients. And so, um, you know, we put guidelines on it. Again, uh, our goal has always been to protect the healthcare system. Uh, we are more and more confident that we have done that, and we will continue to monitor it. Uh, but, uh, and that's why we put guidelines on it, but we feel very good uh, about what we're doing here uh, there'll be more information and data coming from uh, the Department of Health and more guidance for those facilities. But this gives our uh, elective procedures, our, our docs, and our healthcare facilities, which by the way are hurting as well, um, there's no question about that, um, uh, gives them an opportunity to start uh, doing some things that are revenue generating, um, which will be uh, helpful not only to them individually, but, but ultimately to the health and welfare of the public health system. Yes, sir. You said this virus hasn't hit everyone equally. Not everyone has a home office or paid sick days. Will you support mandatory paid sick days for hardworking Mississippians, or is that off the table? Well, look, we, we, I would tell you that I, I don't think anything is off the table um, at this time. We, we are looking at every possible option for um, the, the monies that we have received through the CARES Act. What can we do to help Mississippians? Uh, my number one goal is going to be helping people get back to work. Um, and so uh, we'll look at, at all options as it relates to that. Um, this has been a terribly difficult time uh, for literally uh, every Mississippian, but particularly for those 150,000 that, that are now on unemployment assistance. And we want to do everything in our power to help those individuals. Renee? Kobe Vance from MPB has a question. Kobe? Great. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, you mentioned that Mississippians are following guidance, but um, even Dr. Dobbs expressed earlier this week that he's concerned that people are going to stores not wearing masks. Um, 
What are your What are you telling Mississippians to try to encourage them to follow that guidance? Um, and do you think that um, is a good time to continue reopening the state if people aren't even following that guidance? Well, I'll tell you that we we are encouraging people when they go out to wear a mask. That is the the right thing to do. Um, it is a good thing to do. It protects not only you, it protects your family. Uh, but we also live in a society where not everybody in Mississippi is following our laws against murder or our laws against manslaughter. And so um, there's only so many, so much that government can do. I do believe that the vast majority of Mississippians um, are being responsible. They're, they're not only uh, willing and able to wear masks in, in facilities, but I think we got to do better with masks. I do think we're doing significantly better with social distancing. I think we're doing significantly better uh, with, um, with using hand sanitizer and with washing our hands. Uh, I think that we are definitely aware uh, of the effects of the virus. And if that weren't the case, uh, we would be closer to where IHME said we were going to be uh, on March the 30th, uh, which was needing 8,987 hospital beds, when, wherein we're actually only utilizing 400 hospital beds, about 5% of what they said we need. I think that is proof positive that what we are doing is working. Um, we haven't eliminated the virus, but we have certainly significantly altered the spread of the virus. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Dr. Dobbs, is there any update on putting together recovery data? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. There, there's been a lot of interest in recovery data, but, you know, recovery data is just basically how many people didn't die and are kind of getting back to normal. Um, we do have some estimate numbers I don't have with me, but CDC is coming up with a standard algorithm for all states to share. And so once we get that standard guidance so that we can do, you know, kind of apple to apple comparison state to state, we will plan to publish that daily. Speaking of recovery data, I think it's an important point to make here. Um, uh, and this is something that, that is not definitive at this point. We talked about it earlier today on the call with the Vice President and the Coronavirus Task Force. Um, you know, y'all have heard me talk about the study that was done over this past weekend or released by uh, the professor at Stanford. Uh, there appears to have been a similar study done now in New York State. Uh, there are beginning to be become more um, theories out there regarding the possibility that uh, of all of the confirmed cases that we have in America, uh, as many as 90 percent of those cases could um, could be uh, cases that were not confirmed through a positive test. And so and that number could be much less than that. It could be even more than that. Uh, but I think it, there is becoming a consensus that uh, there was a lot more people who had the virus uh, than who tested positive for it. And that's going to be an extremely important data point as we go forward, particularly into the fall, uh, in terms of how many people have it. Is there, are we anywhere near or at or close to herd immunity or not? And, and so again, we've got a lot of work to do on that, but it is going to be something that we are going to monitor very, very closely in the coming days and weeks and months. Cordia? Um, Dr. Dobbs, uh, hearing from some folks who have tested positive and are saying that they're having a difficulty and maybe they're not going through the right channels, I'm not sure. They had been told that they needed to have two negative results before being cleared to go back to work and, and things of that nature. What are the proper channels for folks to be going through if they're doing that? Is it the state health lab? Or what do they need to be doing? Um, so CDC has published several different guidelines, about, and it's changing all the time, actually, as we learn more about it. Um, one of the, the mechanisms was to get two negative tests, um, and that's, that's something that they should arrange to their employer if, if that's the path they choose. Um, but one of the things that's, that's become painfully obvious is that people's tests for the, de the genetic material lasts well along their illness, well beyond their illness does. And there's new data out of CDC um, that, that demonstrates that for the vast majority of people, the virus is no longer viable after day eight, even if you can find the genetic material, which is not dissimilar from other diseases because it's just basically like the dust left over from dead virus that you're still detecting. Um, so for the Department of Health guidelines, and we're working with CDC, um, to try to find a precise, easy to follow sort of uh, guidance. If you are a case of COVID and you are no longer symptomatic and it's been 14 days, you can go back to work without testing. Testing is not necessary. I just got a question for somebody either at 
second, are dental offices, are they, where, where are dental and doctor offices are, are they still allowed to open or what's, what's their status? Right, right. Currently, you know, dental offices and medical offices are doing only sort of like emergent, you know, really urgent sort of work. And so part of the process here is going to be um, kind of doing more, more elective stuff. But elective stuff's still important. If, if, I tear my, if I tear my shoulder, even though it's not an emergency, it's pretty urgent to me, right? Um, or if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, it's certainly very, it's something that, you know, you need to go back and get checked. So it's going to be the things that are absolutely not necessary, like if it's a routine wellness check, you know, that stuff can probably be delayed. But things that need medical attention, more and more of that's going to be uh, important to have available to Mississippi patients. I think some, some offices, doctor offices, may have closed mm -hmm. under the initial uh, executive order mm -hmm. thinking that they weren't allowed to do elective procedures so they didn't have a reason to be open. Um, do you, you mean like medical offices? Or? Yes, and dental offices. Um, they may have if, if, if they so chose to do, but there were, but there are clear guidance on what emergency procedures could be done if, if, you know, that, you know, that they could and should have, you know, hopefully could be, make sure their patients had access to. Well, seeing no other questions at this time, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I don't have uh, birthday wishes to give today, but I'm either going to give them later today via Facebook Live or I'm going to do it a big one tomorrow. Um, obviously, we have been uh, very, very busy getting these things done, but my commitment to the people of Mississippi uh, is that uh, I am going to uh, make birthday wishes uh, at a minimum through as long as we have a shelter in place in order, and so I will do that over the weekend, and I will get let you all in on a little secret, and that is that we have a very, very important birthday this weekend in the state of Mississippi. Um, I believe it's the First Lady of the United States' birthday and the First Lady of Mississippi's birthday this weekend. So um, be sure and uh, uh, s stick with us, and we'll um, make those birthday wishes uh, over the next few days. Just w follow us on social media, uh, and we'll do that. So, again, I want to thank every single one of you for what you are doing to help us slow the spread of the virus. We are winning this fight, but this fight is not over. Uh, thank you all and God bless.